All right, hi, welcome back, Attorney Steve Vondra, and welcome to another exciting video. Today, we are talking trademarks. We are talking trademark cancellation with the TTAB, Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, a branch of the USPTO. Okay, without further ado, let's head to the Attorney Steve litigation whiteboard. All right, here we are. So um, I want to talk a little bit about trademarks. You know, we do a lot of copyright law, so I'm usually talking copyright up here. But I recently had occasion to file my own trademark cancellation. So I want to talk a little bit about the trademark cancellation proceeding, the procedures, the process, okay? So if somebody is using a, a trademark and they're using it in a way that conflicts with your brand, or is creates a confusing similarity with your brand, there are grounds to cancel somebody else's trademark, even though it's registered, okay? So the USPTO, the Patent and Trademark Office right here, they're the ones that register those trademarks. And sometimes they give out marks, just like the, uh, the patent. Sometimes they give out patents that just literally, frankly, aren't valid. And then once you get down to it and they take a closer look, because many times the um, USPTO will only do a really basic search before they grant a trademark, okay? That's not to say anything negative, but they'll usually search their own records and maybe some other sources. But um, there may be granting of trademarks that conflict with yours and give you grounds, give you damages, or shall we say standing grounds to sue to, to cancel somebody else's trademark. Okay, so here's USPTO, here's the trial trademark and appeals board, a little branch of that. And um, now I want to talk to you about there's two different things. One is if you have somebody has a pending application and you learn about it and you say, well, wait, that's that's conflicting with my brand, with our trademarks, with our our rights. Um, there is a cancel a uh, opposition proceeding. OK, but this is separate from what we're talking about. We're talking about cancellation. Opposition is when you have a pending trademark and you want to oppose it. OK different procedures, so we're not gonna talk about that any further. Whoa, I have some, some boxes down here. Um, so the process gets started with a petition to cancel. The aggrieved party would say, hey, I have some problems here. Their trademark is causing me damage. I'll give you some grounds here in a second to cancel. But file a petition to cancel. They will file an answer. Typically, you will see they will file an answer. So you have the petition to cancel, making clear what your damages damages are and your standing, why you have a right to bring this petition to cancel a trademark. And then you're going to have to have the proper grounds alleged in here as well. So you have an answer. You have a discovery process, just like you will have in normal courts of law. You get to ask questions and this and that, exchange documents. So you have the discovery process. You have a pre-trial pre conference uh, where you try to get things settled and lay out the ground rules. And then you have a trial, which is basically electronic. So it's not like you're showing up in court and swearing in witnesses and everything like that. So it's, a, it's electric, it's digital, and then you have a decision that could be anywhere, say typically a year to 18 months, okay? So this is the general process now. Uh, and, and by the way, there is an expedited process. I'll talk about that in a second. Now, when you're looking to cancel, there is a difference between you're trying to cancel somebody's trademark that has been registered for five years or less, or it becomes more uncontestable after five years. Incontestable is the word. And I'm gonna go over those grounds, okay? So after five years of having the trademark, it's a lot harder to cancel somebody's trademark. But if they're within five years, you have these grounds. Let's go over those. One, uh, fraud on the USPTO. So if somebody is making fraudulent statements about their trademark, about what they're using, the categories, how they're using their mark. If there's fraud on the USPTO, it's not always easy to prove fraud. You can try to cancel their trademark on those grounds, but you better have some evidence. Uh, Non-use for three years. This goes along with abandonment. If somebody... Uh, is claiming a trademark and just not using it, then, you know, why, you know, trademarks are based on use. So the using a trademark is what gives you the rights, using the mark in commerce, as we say. If they're not using it and you can show that, haven't used it for three years, um, non-use, okay? The separate one, but similar is abandonment. And that's where a party has a trademark, but they have intent to abandon and they just abandon it, okay? But you got, again, you got to have to prove 
they intended to abandon it. Now we have no bona fide, no bona fide intent to use. So sometimes somebody will file a trademark application for what we call intent to use. That's what we call 1B filing, B as in biscuit. Um, they'll say, well, I have an intent to use. But if you can show they had no bona fide intent to use, you can try to seek to cancel their trademark on that grounds. Um, this one, the, another one, LLOCC, I call it likelihood of consumer confusion. I always write it LLOC, likelihood of consumer confusion. If you can show that their trademark is causing consumers to be confused uh, as to your brand and their brand, that's what the trademark USPTO tries to prevent is consumer confusion in the marketplace. That's why everything's cut up into um, the classes, the different classes, and you have to be using it in the class. What you say you're doing, you gotta be doing. So likelihood of consumer confusion, and we've had those on, um, I've posted uh, content on this, I know that, on the sleek craft factors, go check those out. There's different factors that you need to show to prove that there's a likelihood of consumer confusion. Next, uh, if you are alleging that a trademark is generic or merely descriptive, that's what I'm doing in my case, generic, it's descriptive, uh, descriptive. I'm alleging it, it's not being used as a trademark. Uh, here, here we have failure to function as a trademark, okay? Those kinds of things. And then finally, dilution. Dilution is, let's say uh, there was a site. Um, so there was a site that got registered. I think it was Mercedes for adult magazines. Well, now it's a totally different category. So like Lexus, Nexus, Lexus. You can have two different people with the same name in different categories like Lexus. One sells uh, a car. The other one sells legal research. Lexus, Lexus. Okay. There was a Mercedes adult magazine. Well, of course, there's the Mercedes tr uh, cars, trucks, SUVs, all that. But it was diluting their brand because Mercedes, now you have to have a famous trademark for dilute. Whoops. I should probably move this before I <laughs> knock myself over. Um, dilution, you have to have a famous trademark, Coke, Pepsi, you know, something on the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, or just, you know, Nike, something famous, you know, Wells Fargo. You have to have like a famous name, okay? So that's dilution. But if you argue that a term is like, you know, all-star software or something, terms are generic, descriptive, those kinds of things, then you can make a challenge of that. So now that's the challenges if they're registered within five years. The trademark has only been used for five years or less. These are some of the different grounds. This is not an exclusive list. This is not legal advice. This is just kind of some guider, some starter, get, get you thinking about cancellation, what it looks like. Um, after five years, there are certain grounds laid out in the Lanham Act. And I just so happen to have my handy copy right here where I'm gonna talk about the if it's after five years, it can become incontestable, so it can become much harder to contest, but there are some limited grounds here that I'm going to read to you um, where you can try to cancel. One, the mark has become the generic name for goods or services. We talked about that here. Uh, generic, uh, the trade. So in other words, generic would be like, um, L, uh, I think it was elevator used to have the, a trademark for the word elevator, but then everybody started calling elevator. Take the elevator, elevator. Elevator became generic. So when a term becomes generic, it's no longer subject to trademark protection. And consequently, that's why brand owners are out there sending cease and desist letters to prevent it from becoming generic. I know there was a case where somebody tried to use a, a reptile type creature and um, the company that uh, represented Godzilla had a problem with uh, somebody with a, uh, a reptile with a tail and <laughs> some teeth or whatever. So um, that's why they're out there protecting their brand. So it does not become generic. That's uh, the death knell for your trademark. Um, the registration was obtained fraudulently. We mentioned that the registration was obtained in violation of the provisions pertaining to collective marks and certification marks. We'll talk about that in another video. There's different, the other two types of trademarks. There's, uh, there is uh, service marks 
and there's trademarks, one's for products, one's for services. They're both considered just registered trademarks. There's collective marks and certification marks. I'll talk about those later. I like Better Housekeeping Seal of Approval, for example. Um, the marks, provisions, the mark consists of immoral, scandalous, or deceptive matter. That may be one grounds to cancel. But there was a case that I talked about. It's the slants. I'm not going to go into it. Google attorney Steve Vondren, the slants. And I have a podcast on that where somebody tried to cancel a mark because they said, well, you, you can't do this. This is sort of uh, um, racist, I think was kind of the claim. And uh, it ended up uh, canceling their trademark, and then I think it was reversed by the Supreme Court of the United States, saying it's free speech. You get some sort of element of free speech. Um, the registration consists of insignia of, of the United States, such as the flag or the coat of arms. The mark consists of a name, portrait, or signature of a living person without their consent, and the mark is being used with the permission of the registrant so as to misrepresent the source of the goods or services. So, so those are some of the things that uh, could pop up. You could see those in your trademark cancellations. But there it is, guys, a general. And again, there is a expedited procedure for cancellation if you're alleging non-use, three years of non-use, abandonment, intentional abandonment, and or dilution. So there is an expedited uh, process, okay? So just bear that in mind. But that's trademark cancellation. If you go through the case, you go through the discovery, you win, get their trademark canceled or limited you know, and those kinds of things. So that's a general process. If you need help with trademark cancellation or an opposition proceeding, you know where to find us on the web at attorneysteve.com. That's attorneysteve.com, the first name in legal services. I got to run. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and share it. And boom. How about a thumb? How about a thumb? Uh-huh. <laughs> Bye now.